Welcome to Mind Love, episode 30. Today's episode is all about becoming who you really are. Getting to know and recognize all of who someone is, regardless of one particular identity, I think is important for all of our relationships so that we can have more genuine relationships with everyone in our lives. Turn up your frequency with Mind Love. Bite-sized brain hacks for seekers, dreamers, and doers. It's time to give your mind a little love with your host, Melissa Monti. Hello, friends. First off, Mind Love is now a CastBox original. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can get all of your favorite podcasts. It has a super clean layout and you can create playlists and download episodes to play offline. It's my personal favorite and where I listen to all of my podcasts. Don't worry, you can still listen to Mind Love wherever you get your podcasts, but I hope you'll give CastBox a try. Second, don't forget to subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening on and leave a review if you can. Reviews really help to entice more amazing guests. Plus, it helps me grow the show, which ultimately helps me give more value to you guys. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about becoming who you really are. Not who you think you should be or who other people think you should be, but who you know you truly are deep in your soul. And we're going to do that with a little insight into the transgender community. Some people might not think that transgender issues necessarily affect them, but here's the thing. The energy of a few affects the collective energy of the whole. If some of our people are oppressed or stigmatized, we feel that on an energetic level. In our culture, people labeled male at birth are expected to conform to masculine stereotypes and females are typically expected to be feminine. But what if none of it feels right? We can all relate on some level to having assumptions about ourselves that don't really feel like us. But what if this assumption was your entire outward expression of yourself? And even worse, what if being who you really are was stigmatized by the general population and even worse, the leader of your country? Our guest today is Ryan Salins. He's a transgender speaker and author of the book Second Son. He became internationally known after the release of the documentary Gender Rebel, which followed him in the beginning steps of his transition from female to male in 2005. We talk about everything from misconceptions about trans people to relationship struggles and things you just shouldn't ask no matter how curious you are. Plus, he opens up about his struggle with an eating disorder and how he came to terms with his gender identity. So today, three key things you will learn are how to gain the courage to step out and be your authentic self, how the struggles of trans people are a mirror to the struggles of everyone, and how to be an ally for the transgender community. Before we dive in, I want to invite you to sign up for the Morning Mind Love. You'll get short daily reminders of your own beauty, worth, and power so you can start each day with a positive mindset and keep your vibes up between episodes. To sign up, visit mindlove.com and sign up right there on the homepage. You'll get some amazing free gifts when you do. First, you'll get our exclusive Powerless booklet, which is an awesome free booklet based on proven principles from the most successful people and some of our favorite guests. Plus, you'll get a free guided affirmation meditation set at the Miracle Tone, which is known to help attract love, health, and abundance into your life. The layered affirmations perfectly tune your frequency for personal transformation. So be sure to head to mindlove.com to sign up. Or if you're out and about, just text the word MORNING to 444-999. That's MORNING to 444-999. And now let's welcome Ryan Salins to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's get into your story a little bit. When was the first time that you felt that your gender just didn't match what you felt inside? Well, for me, my first memory was around age two and a half to three years old. Some people can have a sense as early as 18 months, though, when it comes to gender identity. But for me, it went specifically back to a memory of being outside on a summer day we lived in the country and we had a underground pool. And my mom that day had put me in a bright, hot pink bikini. And I remember standing outside by the pool in this bikini and seeing my dad and my brother in swimming trunks and my mom and my sister in bathing suits. 
And just observing the world around me, I proceeded then to take the top part off of that bikini so that I could have swimming trunks like my dad and my brother. Um, it was me looking at the world for the first time and viewing gender and trying to align my form of expression with what felt right for me. What was that like during your formative years? Were these feelings always on the forefront of your mind or were they something that you could bury sometimes? Um, for me, it was interesting because when you're younger, you still have a lot of magic in your life. And so even with that realization, I still thought that I would just be turning into a boy one day. It wasn't until age seven where I was just standing in the bathroom one day washing my hands and it just hit me. This realization and understanding that my body was female and that it would not be turning to male. And I remember that day just saying verbatim, this sucks. I've got dealt a bad deck of cards and I need to live with this the rest of my life and I don't know if I can. And I started to become very depressed after that realization. And actually, that's when suicide ideation started entering into my mind. So where did you go from there? Or what gave you the courage to start to voice some of these feelings you were having? Well, I wasn't voicing them at all. Um, I actually kept everything inside. I didn't let people know about the hurt that I was feeling and the fears that I was feeling because I didn't know how to express it. And I was scared to. And so I internalized everything, but I did have one moment of hope during that time. And that happened one morning when I was up on a weekend and I always got up early when I was little and I ended up in our TV room and I ended up watching HBO and there was this movie on called Something Special. And in it, this character who looked a lot like me and was a girl was under the stars one night and wished to be a boy. And the next morning she woke up a boy. And it gave me that little brief moment of hope. Magic wasn't completely gone yet in my life. And so that kept me going for a little while when I was still in the elementary school age range of just hoping that something, a miracle would happen and I would just wake up one day and be me. I've never heard anyone reference this movie before, <laughs> but the basic premise is this girl wants to be a boy and she makes a wish on a shooting star and wakes up with a penis. <laughs> and so then she's kind of surprised herself and she almost goes on a penis showing tour, I want to call it. <laughs> but really, she's going through this transition and having to explain it to people. And so she ends up showing her principal and her doctor. And yeah. I thought I was the only person who's seen this movie. <laughs> it's pretty great, actually. Actually, rewatching a lot of the movies from the 80s, I think, would be good for a lot of people right now. Last night, I just rewatched 9 to 5. And, you know, with the Me Too movement and everything, I'm like, I think everybody should be watching 9 to 5 again right now. We could learn something from it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> when, when was it that you did finally start to voice these things? And who was the first person that you told? Um, actually, I didn't voice it until age 25 when I finally understood that I was transgender. And so I kept everything held within myself, which I think is one of the reasons why when I was 19, I became severely ill with anorexia nervosa, my eating disorder that, while not all that was related to gender, because there's contributing factors that um, influence eating disorders, there's a large part that there was around the, my gender. And I think my disorder was a way to try to show people the pain that I was feeling inside, but couldn't share with them. Most of you listeners out there know that my eating disorder is a big part of my story as well. Hold on. Actually, I need to change the way I just said that. I'm not calling it my eating disorder anymore. I'm not going to claim that shit. The eating disorder is its own thing that I mistakenly held space for for way too long. And second of all, it was a big part of my story. Your words affect your life, and what you claim as here and now will continue to affect you. So that shit is past tense, and even though it still makes a point to pop its head in every now and again to see if there's room for it at the table, or so to speak, I have the most important thing, which is awareness. I know its tricks, and I have the tools to deal with it when the time comes. But back to my point. When you're not living authentically you, or you have unprocessed emotion or trauma, it doesn't mean that you found a loophole and you don't have to deal with it. 
what it means is that instead of dealing with it consciously, you're leaving it up to your subconscious. And in most cases, this means it's going to seep out in some physical or psychological manifestation, such as an eating disorder or depression or anxiety or even illness or autoimmune disorders. So how do you go about processing these things? There are a lot of ways, including talking with a therapist, more modern methods like EMDR, or even working with energy healers. But more simply, it requires sitting with it. Regardless of which method you choose, you're going to have to sit with it. Allowing yourself to be in the discomfort, allowing yourself to feel through the painful emotions, and most of all, coming back to who you are and having the courage and the confidence to live your truth. When you finally gathered the strength to talk about these feelings of being transgender, was it still a really difficult thing to put into words or had it become so difficult to keep inside that that just was no longer an option? So talking about being transgender was very scary for me because I just feared more rejection. Uh, I feared rejection from my girlfriend, who I had been with for about a year at that point, who was lesbian identified. I feared further rejection from my mom and dad. Uh, and I feared rejection even from my own therapist. I had questions in my mind around, am I really transgender or is this really related to my eating disorder and my negative body image? And if I even come out to my therapist, well, she accept me and validate my transgender identity or will she too try to say it's because of my eating disorder so i was very fearful in the in the beginning steps of sharing with everyone who i was so i realized without having gone through something like this specifically it's hard to even fathom but that makes a lot of sense Validation plays a big part in our human experience, and sometimes we even base how we feel off of the reactions of others. So coming to a realization so transforming would be terrifying because you don't know if people are going to try to talk you out of it, you don't know if they're going to make fun of you, or just turn their backs on you altogether. How did you even prepare for something like that? Well, I don't know if we can ever fully plan or understand what to expect when you come out because you just never know how people are going to react. You know, sometimes you come out to people and you're so fearful and then, and then you say, you know, I'm trans. They're like, great, because you passed the mashed potatoes, right? Uh, other times people do uh, have negative reactions to it. So you cannot really ever fully plan because that's unknown. Uh, but for me... The first person I came out to was my girlfriend because she's the person closest to me. And I remember with her, she was not on board for me fully transitioning. Um, so I tried to do baby step, steps and compromises with her. So the first step I wanted to do my transition from female to male was to have chest surgery done. And she was accepting of me having chest surgery, but she did not want me to start on hormone therapy, which for my case, that would be doing testosterone. Uh, and so I tried compromising and thinking that chest surgery would be enough, but I knew it wouldn't be. And so I told her I'd have to move forward uh, in my own transition um, to be who I am. And we continued to work on our relationship for five more years before we did end up breaking up. Uh, with my therapist, when I told her, she said, I've never worked with a transgender person, but I'm willing to learn. And that's really all I needed from her is just one for her to validate that I was trans and to recognize she doesn't have knowledge, but she's willing to be there to support me. Uh, when I came out to my parents, my dad fully rejected me um, for six months and my mom tried to bargain with me to try to slow my transition down. And so it was very difficult with them. Um, but it's been 13 years since I transitioned and each year they've slowly turned another corner to acceptance. Wow. It's like on one hand, you're terrified of losing the people you love when you come out with this big secret that you've been holding on to. But on the other hand, when you aren't living authentically you, those that love you aren't loving the real you. It's the same as or at least can be applied to any time that you're trying to be someone that you aren't or living some sort of lie. We sort of touched on that concept in episode 25 when we talked about faking orgasms and how I had gotten to a place where I had been faking them for so long that 
admitting that I had been lying for so long became harder than actually facing the root of the problem. The longer you live in that inauthentic place, the harder it'll be to find or even recognize who you really are or what you truly desire. For you, what was the hardest part of transitioning that might not seem so obvious to people on the outside or who have never gone through something quite like this? Oh, that's a that's a interesting question because let me let me there, there's a lot of things that are hard about transitioning. Uh, I guess you know the obvious ones would be you know just looking at the financial resources for it, and then again acceptance versus rejection, um, employment, especially if you're currently employed and transitioning on the job uh, can be extremely scary. Or trying to find a job can be really scary. But I think internally it's more just trying to find peace and acceptance of all of who you are. Um, That includes your past prior to your transition and also who you are now and being able to integrate those. And that can take a lot of time. Sometimes people try to completely reject their old selves and say that person's dead to me. Uh, Other times it's just People are like, you know, I want to be able to accept or see pictures of myself in the past, but it's just going to take more time for me to feel more comfortable in my skin now. What I find interesting is that even though we all struggle with such different things and people like to call some worse than the others, some more extreme than the others, a lot of the actual emotional struggles are the same. For example, I feel like I've grown so much in the last few years that sometimes I become embarrassed about who I was before. And while on one hand, like I said earlier, there are certain things that I don't want to claim as my own anymore or identify with anymore, these things were also a part of my journey. They're part of what pushed me to become who I am today. And without some of those things... I may not have ever been motivated to climb as high as I want to go now. So I imagine that having gone through all you went through with an eating disorder and also feeling out of place in your own skin, what were some of the ways that you started to change your inner dialogue? I can only personally relate to an eating disorder, but I know for me, I had to be pretty low and be saying some pretty negative things in my head in order for me to be okay with doing that kind of damage to my body. So what were some of the ways that you started to change that internal conversation with yourself? I think it's just each day just trying to find a new thing that you can really appreciate about and what it does for you and where it takes you. Um, There are some days, though, where I am really still hard on my body. You know, eating disorders are a mental illness where you're not cured from eating disorders. It's a very um, deceiving name to be called because we just think about the food issue, but there's something else going on within the brain that goes beyond food. And so I say my ed brain can be very loud sometimes. Um, Then other times I have more positive feelings. And I recognize that the negative versus positive feelings that I have in my body are really related to my sense of safety, my sense of support, my sense of connection, my sense of fitting in. All those things impact how I actually feel within myself. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about transgender men and women that are just really frustrating for you? Well, thinking about youth, what frustrates me is when people try to write off trans youth who speak uh, and say, oh, you're just going through a phase, you know, or this isn't really real. You just need to take more time. You're too young to understand this. Kids know. I mean, again, we can have a sense of our gender identity as early as 18 months of age. There are kids that are two to three years old that can know that they're transgender. Uh, So to write them off and not to recognize or validate their identities is extremely disheartening because we see such high rates of suicide attempts and and, um, full uh, committed suicides among trans youth. For adults, I think it's very frustrating how people try to put trans people within these very rigid and restricted boxes around beauty ideals. So they focus on the physical appearance of an individual and the beauty ideals that we have within our society, instead of just looking at an individual for the whole being that they are uh, and recognizing that it's very difficult to be trans in this world. It's very difficult to find the resources, the providers that support you, the families, and also communities. And so to try to base our value on looks is appalling. 
to try to base our value on looks is appalling. Again, not trying to say I have any idea what the struggles of being transgender feel like, but that is a sentence that I can relate to just being a woman. There was a book released last year called Beauty Sick. It's about our cultural obsession with appearance and how harmful it can be. It actually argued that our obsession with women's looks in particular, amounts to a society-wide psychological illness. And it says that women's emotional energy gets so bound up in what they see in the mirror that it becomes harder for them to see other aspects of their lives altogether. There were some studies in there that said that 82% of college-aged women report comparing their body unfavorably to a model's body which is another reason that photo retouching can be so harmful. But here's the kicker. 70% of young women say they believed they would be treated better by others if they looked more like the beauty ideal that they see in the media. Something about seeing that written down really struck a chord with me, but I have to be honest with myself and admit that I have felt that way. I felt that way for a really long time. So now, especially women listening out there, imagine... All of those feelings that you wrap up in your looks, or how you wish that you looked, or how much you wish you weighed, now wrap that up in feeling like you're in the wrong body altogether. Or like Ryan said, like you've been dealt a really bad hand. Maybe it hurts just as bad as the hurt that I felt. Maybe it hurts worse. But that's irrelevant. What is relevant is that we all hurt. Whether people are going through completely different hardships or the same one, that pain is going to affect each person in a different way. We are all one of a kind, completely unique beings, and we will never truly know what it's like to be anyone other than ourselves, which is kind of a good segue to my next question. What's it like facing people who think transgender is a choice, like a new outfit you're trying on? Is this still something that you have to deal with, or has our society evolved enough that it's not as much of an issue? Uh, I haven't been receiving that as much, maybe just because of the different spheres that I've been working in lately. But yeah, definitely in the past, I've heard that, or I just hear it in general, speaking about transgender people, or even when we talk about LGB identities or Q identities around sexual orientation and saying it's a choice. People, you do not choose your sexual orientation. You do not choose your gender identity. It's just who you are. You're born with both. All of us are, and they develop over time. And your understanding of them develops over time. You know, I am so grateful for my transition and so grateful for the resources and providers I've been able to work with. Even the negative experiences, I'm still grateful for where I'm at. But definitely, this is not something you just choose to do. It is so difficult both emotionally and physically to undergo a transition. Hold that thought. Summer is just a few weeks away and I actually feel ready thanks to Mod Cloth. If you love vintage inspired fashion or clothes that just let you express your unique style, you will love Mod Cloth. I'm speaking at my first conference next month and I needed something professional but with a fun unique flair that helps me stand out a little and I found the perfect outfit. I got a super cute pair of yellow culottes with a sleeveless cowl neck top. Plus, I got a shirt called Podcast Host, which I obviously had to have. And I'm amazed to say that everything fits perfectly and feels super high quality. I also have my eye on this high-waisted polka dot swimsuit, but I'll save that for next time. They have tons of styles and a little something for everyone. Plus, they have a full range of sizes from XXS to 4X. You can get 15% off your purchase of $100 or more if you go to M-O-D-C-L-O-T-H dot com and enter code MIND at checkout. Hurry, though. This offer expires September 1st, 2018. That's promo code MIND, M-I-N-D, to get 15% off your mod cloth order by September 1st, 2018. You have a really close relationship with your brother. How has that relationship changed since your transition? 
You know, our relationship is actually the same as it was before. <laughs> uh, we play video games together. Uh, now we're doing virtual reality video games together, which are awesome. Uh, you know, we will just hang out and talk. Uh, we text a lot. So we actually had the same relationship that we had prior to my transition. But I've always been very close to him. Even as a kid, I was extremely close to him. How did he react when you first told him about your gender identity? So he was actually the first person in my family that I came out to. And for him, I actually sent him an email uh, um, because it was just still, I was scared. And in the email, I just, you know, first said, hey, Greg, how's it going? How's the weather? Because that's always a safe topic to begin with, right? And then I said, well, so just, you know, I'm transgender. This is what this means. Here are some people's websites who have transitioned. I am going to be beginning this process and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay, love you. Bye. And he emailed me back the same day. And it was just one line. It just said, I'm not surprised. I just saw a documentary on this. I thought you were transgender anyway, right? And just getting that email from him, it was <laughs> so uplifting. Uh, it gave me hope. And then the next day, he sent me one more email that just said, okay, I'm freaking out now, which I didn't take that as a negative email. He was just being very honest that he was there for me, but he was scared. He didn't know what would happen to me with my transition and if I'd be safe. There's a lot of unknowns. But fortunately for him, he just let go of the unknowns and the what ifs and just was there for me as my brother and friend. There's so much beauty in that response. First off, that he was honest with you, that he was freaking out. Being honest in your emotions, but in love allows the other person to be more honest with theirs as well. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that validation or that recognition, I should say, letting in that he already had a feeling that this was something that you were going through, lets you know that he really did see you for who you are. It's like we're all just looking for that from other people, like someone to really say, hello, I see you. I recognize you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's so funny because even before coming out to him as trans, uh, a few years prior to that, when I was in my undergraduate of college, I was with his his then wife and we were in a parking lot somewhere and she just said, are you a lesbian? I mean, it's OK if you are. We love you. And one, I was not identifying that way at the time. And two, it just was, <laughs> I just knew that everybody was talking about me. And just, you know, I think they just could pick up there was something about me that was not heterosexual or heteronormative. <laughs> uh, and so it was just kind of funny. It actually made me laugh when she asked that. <laughs> what do you wish that someone had told you when you were younger and in the thick of it all? Again, I think it had been hard for people to tell me anything because I wouldn't wasn't talking about it, uh, especially growing up in the 80s. We didn't have the conversations or information or access to images of folks who are trans like we do today. Um, so, you know, if I if it was today and we had all this information around, I was a little kid, uh, just having someone just say, I love you for who you are. And I'm excited for you to teach me who you are. It's just impossible for me to think about what people could tell me back then because I just was not open about it. I love the way you put that. I'm excited for you to teach me because I think a lot of fear comes from that unknown or even just the unfamiliar or the discomfort of not knowing what to say or not wanting to accidentally offend someone. But it's a good reminder to go into any unknown situation with curiosity instead of assumptions. Are there any common things that people say or questions they may ask that are offensive that they might not realize at the time? Well, if you know someone who is who identifies as transgender, who's transitioning, you know, it's first really important if you did not know their name that they were given at birth, not to ask. Right. Or to say, what is your real name? Uh, because doing that invalidates the person's identity and their name that they have now that they shared with you. Uh, also, it's important to stay away from any intruding questions. Like I always say, just think about how you interact with other people in your life and what questions you know would be appropriate or inappropriate and apply the same thing to someone who you know is trans, right? So for example, you're not going to ask someone, tell me about your genitals today. Um, so just, you know, steer clear of surgical questions unless someone wants to share that information and they volunteered it in the first place that they want to talk about it, right? If the trans person wants to open up and talk about something in their life, they're opening up that door. 
and they can also set the parameters of, well, you've asked something that's a little bit too offensive, right? Uh, but you should never be prying into people's experience or their bodies. And then the, the last one um, is, again, just talking about beauty ideals and making comments about people's physical appearances. Again, we wouldn't do that with other individuals who aren't trans, so it's important not to, you know, say things. One that I get a lot, which I know people aren't trying to be offensive, but, you know, oh, you just make such a, a handsome man, but you're also such a beautiful woman. And I'm just, it's really weird for me to hate here. And again, you're putting people into these ideal boxes that are just uncomfortable. I agree completely. It's like, why would you focus on someone's physical appearance when there are so many other things that you could zero in on? With my own struggles in mind, even when somebody says, oh, you look like you've lost weight, all I can think of is, okay, so I was right. You are focused on my weight. I just feel like we can do better. Like, let's go deeper than that. Yeah, yeah, because you, you never know what someone's going through when you make comments about actual physical body appearances. Now, if you say, oh, you have such a glow around you today, like, you know, a glow could be different. <laughs> that doesn't have to be about body shape or size. You know, you can, you can look at, pick up on different energies from people. As far as our society goes, do you see any progress that's being made that's really encouraging for the transgender community? Well, not to get political, but I will say that the past few years have been detrimental to the LGBTQ community as a whole. With the current administration, they are slowly eroding every issue and rights that people work so hard to be put into place. Uh, so many people are actually really struggling right now. But looking on the positive side, we are seeing more and more companies that recognize the importance of LGBTQ inclusion. We see more and more companies standing up for LGBTQ individuals uh, and their employees and creating policies that help and assist people who um, identify as LGBT. We're seeing more and more openings with insurance with different states that now have taken away any exclusions for accessing health care for transgender individuals. We still have a lot of work to do on that. We still have a lot of work to do with employment protections, but we're seeing people recognize the value. We're having more people speak up. We're having more families get connected with one another. We're having more research being put out there so that we can have better care. Uh, so there are a lot of positive advancements happening, but with the administration, it's, it's very scary for people right now. My hope with that is that it's a giant wake-up call to those that have been less active or didn't think that voting mattered as much. I know for me, this last election, I became so much more passionate and politically active than I'd ever been before, because it's easy to assume that there's always going to be progress until the switch is flipped. But I also think that rather than identifying so closely with any political party, it can be a lot more productive and rewarding even to identify more with the causes or issues that you believe in. I've taken it as an opportunity to become just really clear on the issues that are important to me and look for ways to become involved in those instead of Republican versus Democrat or liberal versus conservative, because it's easy to forget what you're fighting for when you're fighting each other. But as far as the transgender issues go, are you hopeful? Well, I, I will say I'm very grateful for the court system right now. Um, the courts are working very hard to continue to keep protections in place uh, the amount of lawsuits against administration right now are ridiculous on many different areas, not just LGBTQ issues. So I do put a lot of hope and faith into the court system right now to continue to protect us until the time comes, hopefully very soon, uh, that we see a shift in leadership. When you're public speaking at schools and raising awareness for some of these issues, what have you found is the one thing that kids need to hear the most? These kids just need to know that who they are is who they are, and they're beautiful for that, and that they will be loved, and if they don't feel loved right now, to be able to reach out and to talk to someone, just to find out one person that they can know will support them. Kids today, they need connection. And with internet and with social media and with technology, it can actually 
prohibit a lot of forms of connection, even though you think that will actually connect you more. <laughs> uh, because I think the human interaction piece, the the, the face to face, you know, the different things that you get in those relationships is different from when you're communicating through a phone or through a computer. Um, so that connection piece is just really important for them right now. When I was doing research for this interview, I was looking for some of the biggest misconceptions that maybe I could help clear up through this episode. And I was surprised to find that people have a really hard time differentiating between sexual orientation and gender identity. Why do you think that is? And what do you think could help with that? Because unfortunately, our nation does a terrible job at sexuality education, um, you know, not be, having access to comprehensive sex ed, or if you do have access to comprehensive sex ed, they may be leaving out anything around LGBT identities or understanding sexual orientation beyond heterosexual identities. Uh, so that's one of the things I love to do wherever I go. It's talking about the differences between gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. And recognizing that sexual orientation is your erotic, affectionate, or, and romantic orientation towards other individuals, and that your gender identity is, is your psychological identification of gender. Um, and it's wonderful when we do this because then people, why, what I specifically try to do is make people know this relates to all of us. This is not just an LGBT issue. Um, it's something that is part of all of who we are as sexual human beings. Sex ed totally sucks in this country. Research shows that most formal sex ed centers around abstinence or sexual diseases, but 41% of 18 and 19 year olds know little to nothing about condoms and 45% say they know nothing about contraception. And that's not even touching on the complete lack of education around the female orgasm, which I based a whole episode on. If you're interested in that, check out episode 25 with Carrie Otis. But we're definitely paying for this because the U.S. has the highest rate of STDs and teen pregnancies of all developed countries. So there's that. The crazy part is, it looks like this may be the fault of parents, because a survey found that 90% of parents still believe that teaching kids about abstinence is more beneficial to their future than a more well-rounded sex education. Based on stats alone, a lot of these parents might have a kid with a dirty little secret. The worst part is, nine states actually have what's called no-promo-homo laws that require open discrimination against queer youth. Because discrimination and hate are so commonplace in most schools, queer teens experience much higher rates of bullying, which might explain why queer teens are four times more likely to commit suicide than straight teens and four times more likely to have a mood disorder, like depression, bipolar, or anxiety. I can't help but compare that I definitely experienced my fair share of teenage angst and depression and thinking that life was just too hard to go on. I can still remember just how alone I felt sometimes, and I was a straight white female. What would it feel like to be a transgender girl or boy and not even feel safe in your own body? One of the questions I've gotten from listeners the most, regardless of their sexual identities or orientations, is how to stop caring what other people think so much. When you're transgender, you're constantly faced with people who are uncomfortable with who you are. I am still learning who I authentically am. So how much harder would it be when you're faced with so much resistance toward your own personal identity? So how do you stop caring what other people think so you can live your life as who you know you are on the inside instead of what everyone else wants you to be on the outside? Well, I guess there's two different levels to working through that. The first level is just the people that are close to you in your life, right? If they're not accepting of you, I always say it's important to surround yourself with your chosen family, which may not be your real family, right? And surround yourself with the positive energy in your life and to not let those individuals take you down and their negative energy. Have patience, give them time and space. And when they're ready to let go of judgment 
um, or assumptions or hate and actually have a relationship with you, start to do that healing work with them to have that relationship. You know, when my parents rejected me, that was extremely hard. And I had to remind myself that it wasn't about me. It's about them. It's about their own fears, their own misunderstandings uh, around transgender identities. And I had to give them their space to do their work. They need to do their work around this, right? And you can be there, but if you start noticing that they're impacting you and you're starting to have negative feelings about yourself, it's time to take a step away to take care of yourself. If I'm in a space like doing a, a presentation in a large room, I'm not going to assume that everybody in there actually wants to be in there or that everybody in there is accepting of LGBT identities. But my hope is, is that one, they showed up. So my hope is that being there, they can at least have their ears open enough to hear a story and hopefully be able to connect with me some way through that story and start thinking about ways they can change their own views of people who identify as LGBT. Surrounding yourself with only those people that lift you higher can be helpful no matter who you are, which is also a good reminder to always be that person for someone else. Lift your friends higher, support their dreams no matter how crazy they sound, and give them the freedom to be who they are without judgment. Was there anyone in your life that was particularly supportive that you may not have been expecting it from? Well, I remember my parents did not want me telling either one of my grandmas that I was transgender. Uh, one grandma had moderate Alzheimer's, and so she was very confused. And I actually never did tell her that I was trans. She would see me and she'd be like, your voice sounds different. <laughs> 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 and then like over the years, she'd just be, sometimes you'd see her go like, he, she, she, he, she was a little bit confused. And then one day she said, well, at least your laugh's the same, right? But there was no point in telling her because she wouldn't remember. And then she passed away, sadly. But my other grandma, I told her, even though my mom told me not to, and she was just right there supportive of me. And she lived, uh, prior to her passing, she lived in a very, very, very small town in the center part of Nebraska, uh, where I grew up, along the the Platte River in the country, and she would send me clippings of people that she read about who were transgender, and she told all the family on that side that I was trans, and all of them were supportive of who I was. And so, you know, it's great to have uh, the the matron, the matriarchy there, our grandma, be the one being like, this is my grandkid, and I love them. And everybody else was also open to it. I am often surprised by some of the things my grandma says, too. She grew up in a whole different time, so I feel like she could be a little close-minded, and I might even give her a pass, but it's easy to forget sometimes that she also has all these years of experience and all these years of really figuring out what's important in life, and I think one of the things that she's realized is that her family is what matters most to her, and it doesn't matter what mistakes we've made. She sees us and loves us for who we are. Yeah. And, you know, my wife and I always say the people that take the news the best are the young and the old. So the little kids are always super open and loving. And the old people generally are the more loving and open just because they've lived through so much. <laughs> Doesn't mean that everybody's that way when they're old, but majority we see that they do a lot better at the news and that what people would assume. Are there any unique challenges that come in a transgender relationship that people might not think of? You know, I think challenges that folks may have when someone is trans in a relationship actually may mirror what we can see in heterosexual relationships as well, right? So one challenge may be around fertility and family planning, right? If people want children, how are they going to have children and what are the options for them? Another challenge is communicating around your comfort in your body and um, intimately what you feel is comfortable and and what you feel could either be triggering or traumatizing to your body. Being able to navigate to if you've been with someone prior to them transitioning, and let's say prior to transitioning, you would be walking a world being viewed as a heterosexual couple. And then someone transitions, say you have someone who was born assigned male that transitions to female, still partnered with their their girlfriend, wife, spouse, sweetie, then walking around and, and understanding that you will be viewed as lesbian couple. And 
for someone who had lived maybe the majority of their life as heterosexually viewed, that can be uh, challenging for folks. On the flip side, when then you walk around the world being viewed as a heterosexual couple and you've had previous experience of being LGBT, that can also be interesting for you just to see how people treat you differently and your own feelings around your identity uh, and what people know about you. For those of us who want to make sure that we show up for the people in our lives and we do spread love and make people feel comfortable being who they are. What are some ways that we can be an ally and provide support for transgender people? Well, first, if you have people in your life who are trans, just every once in a while, just send them a message to say, you know, I love you. I hope you're having a good day. It doesn't have to be anything big about them being trans, but just, you know, letting people know you're there and letting them know that you appreciate them is important. Um, outside of people that you are personally uh, involved with learning more, you know, watching documentaries, watching films, reading people's memoirs, uh, attending a, a presentation. Like if I'm out somewhere at a university, those are most often free and open to the public. So coming to the talk and listening, right. And talking to folks afterwards, uh, just so that you can educate your, yourself more on the topic and what it means to be trans. And then also when we look at the political sphere, if there's legislation up that is anti-trans legislation or anti-LGBT, you know, doing what you can to advocate for the LGBT community and how you do not support whatever legislation they have that could harm the community. Some people might not have any transgender people that are close to them, so they just might feel really far removed from these issues. But I want to give people an idea of the effects of all of this. What does it feel like to be in a position where who you are is denied so much that you're basically being rejected by the administration of your own country? It feels kind of like a repetitive cycle for many people because many people may reject, be rejected from their own families, be rejected from their schools, be rejected from their communities, be rejected from their religious organizations. So seeing this, it just reinforces that feeling um, that they have or this thought that I am not lovable, uh, I'm not going to be accepted, uh, I'm not going to be able to move forward in my life because of X, Y, Z. It's important, though, to again recognize all the important advancements that have been made for the LGBT community um, over the past 70 years uh, and to know that this administration is not, even though they're trying very hard, they're not going to roll us back. We will continue to move forward. Uh, we'll continue to provide support and find ways to create affirming and inclusive environments. Well, thank you so much for your courage in being who you really are and also for educating people on some of these important issues that aren't always talked about. So thank you for that. And before we end our time together, is there anything else that you just think is really important for listeners to know? Well, you know, one thing I always like to share at the end of my talks is that it's important to recognize that being trans is an aspect of a person's identity. It's not all who they are, right? I am a transgender man, but I'm also a pretty good carpenter. I'm a great pet dad. I'm a spouse. I am a sibling. I am a son. You know, I'm a friend that will be over there to help you if you need it. So getting to know and recognize all of who someone is, regardless of one particular identity, I think is important for all of our relationships so that we can have more genuine relationships with everyone in our lives. So true. For listeners who are interested in finding out more about you, where can they find you online? Uh, if people would like to learn more about me and my work or to read my book, uh, you can go to my website, ryansalens.com. And my book is Second Son, Transitioning Towards My Destiny, Love, and Life. I am currently in the process of working on my second book that I hope to have out in the spring of 2019. I'm not going to release the title yet, even though I really wish I could. Uh, but do note that will be coming out and that will be reflecting on life post-transition. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for coming on the show, spreading your wisdom and allowing us to open up the dialogue about some of these issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions and for having this topic as part of your great podcast. I hope you all loved this episode and will join me in just doing your part in making every single person that you come in contact with feel loved, 
seen, acknowledged, and free to be themselves, just as you deserve people to treat you. Also, in light of the suicides this week, I feel called to say that reach out to someone you love. Tell them you're thinking about them. Even the strongest people have pain, and you never know who you can touch just by giving the gift of your own presence. For all of the links mentioned in this episode, head to mindlove.com slash 030. I'll link to Ryan's website as well as his book, Second Son. Please don't forget to subscribe. And if you have a moment, leave a review on iTunes or a comment on CastBox. I love hearing from all of you. And if you didn't get the memo at the beginning of this episode, sign up for the Morning Mind Love at mindlove.com or text MORNING to 444-999. Thanks for giving your mind a little love today, and I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into your higher frequency with Mind Love. Head to mindlove.com for a free gift to keep your vibes up until next week.